Um, my name is David Cutler and I'm director of the Bering Foundation. Um, I felt um, both delighted and honoured to be invited to talk a little bit about our mapping work on creative opportunities for people living with mental health problems. Um, I wanted to start off by sharing two emotions uh, with you. Uh, the first one is an almost indescribable sense of relief that after about 30 seconds, the technology is uh, still working. Um, so I'm hoping that that uh, carries on. And I think already is a vote of confidence in the organizers. And the second is a pretty strong sense of uh, imposter syndrome. I'm really acutely aware of my limitations as a commentator on uh, this very, very important issue. I know that you've got a tremendous uh, symposium. Uh, you've got contributions from uh, artists working this area, from people with lived experience and uh, with academics and also academics who are uh, artists and all variations. So I think they will, will make up for a number of uh, my limitations. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes or so about a report that you'll find on our website and probably links in your papers called Creatively Minded. And I wanted to start off by just giving you a summary, three very important points I'd like to make from that report. And the first one is, if you have a moment, the thing to read is the foreword. Uh, the foreword is by a woman who's now a local artist uh, working in Norfolk. Her name is Dolly Sen. Uh, she's a woman whose uh, practice is shaped by her experience of mental health problems. And she writes quite brilliantly uh, in a short foreword about the importance uh, of this uh, field. I tried to do a few quotations uh, not long ago from Dolly's work, and I realized that every sentence is quotable, every sentence is powerful. So please go to that forward to our document. And then two points that I think summarize what we found in Creatively Minded. The first is that creative opportunities and arts and mental health, in my view, lie at an important intersection. And that's what is a major reason for its dynamism and significance. It's an intersection of creativity, well-being and of activism. And each of those strands, each of those elements brings different motivations and different dynamics. And with that, uh, my last point in summary comes tremendous complexity. I think it's complexity in every direction that you look. It's complexity of motivation, as I've just said. It's complexity because of intersectionality, uh, the many different aspects of personality and lived experience. It's complexity in the breadth and um, contested nature of mental health itself. Uh, where everything about mental health and diagnosis, I think, is up for debate and up for question, and with tremendously strong views in different directions. And it's complex in terms of providers of those creative opportunities. So in our report, uh, we refer to 170. In a later report, we refer to 250 organisations uh, in the UK, almost all of which are arts organisations, where this is an important element 
or often the sole concern for the organization. And of course, it doesn't stop there. That's mainly arts organizations, but there's also individual artists, freelance artists, um, mental health charities such as Mind, recovery colleges, parts of the NHS, tremendous degree of variety and complexity. The next thing I'd like to mention is that I'm very aware that language is important, but also difficult when it comes to exploring these issues. I'm gonna be using the phrase mental health problem, but I'm very aware that there are many different descriptions that people use, that there are uh, strongly held preferences, whether it's talking about a mental health issue or whether it's talking about mental health uh, distress. Um, I don't believe there is a consensus uh, around uh, language. And for the sake of, we have to use words though. And for the sake of uh, the report, we came down on mental health problem, which is the phrase uh, most commonly used, I think, particularly for instance, by mind. But um, it's certainly the case that the whole gamut of descriptions of mental health are questioned uh, and in, including the very concept of diagnosis and also of recovery. These are all controversial areas. And um, slightly less controversial, but only just slightly less, is talking about the arts. We would, at the Bang Foundation, normally talk about uh, creativity, um, sometimes interchangeably with arts. But for the sake of these um, few comments I'm going to make, I'd just like to emphasize that we're interested in the broadest possible range of creative uh, expression. Uh, and that would include so-called uh, uh, popular culture or popular art. Again, all these uh, terms are open to question. I'm just going to say a couple of words about the organisation that I work for, for those of you that, that don't know us, perhaps many. The Bering Foundation's an independent uh, funder. We've been going for over 50 years, and in all that time, we've funded creativity and the arts, but that's uh, one part of a broader um, program. Uh, central to everything that we do is a wish to challenge and tackle discrimination and disadvantage, and to view that from uh, a concept of human rights, including when it comes to creativity and culture and seeing access to culture and the capacity to be creative themselves as rights. And that shapes uh, how we look at uh, the arts and mental health. Uh, I won't talk about our other programs, but there are uh, two other areas uh, that we're working in. And um, sadly for us, and possibly for some of you, we are a small foundation. So we will be funding around uh, one and a quarter million pounds of uh, work in arts and mental health uh, for probably the next uh, 10 years. We haven't got an end date uh, as yet, but we hope very much that that will uh, increase as we form partnerships with other funders. So uh, over and beyond those couple of um, introductory comments, um, I'd like to think for a moment about history. I think history is important. There have always been artists for whom uh, an experience of mental health problems has been important or sometimes uh, quite central to their work. And although the concepts that we're using now would not have been the concepts uh, hundreds of years ago, we can see the traces of those uh, discussions uh, in their work. Um, and we can all instantly think of, for instance, visual artists 
the most uh, some of the biggest um, exhibitions in the last couple of years have been uh, around from by Monk and uh, Van Gogh with quite um, direct discussions of their mental health uh, experiences. Uh, Yuya Kasuma is probably one of the most um, visited scene artists uh, in the world who for a long time has lived nearby a psychiatric institution in, uh, in Japan and has found that um, the basis of, of her support and her practice. But there are vast numbers of other artists that we could talk about. Perhaps something that's uh, discussed less is that uh, alongside artists themselves, there is also a long history of creativity in mental health settings. And certainly um, roughly 200, uh, just beyond two, less than 200 years ago, and in the early Victorian times, there's uh, important uh, records of uh, creative work, mainly music, singing, and visual arts in what we would now think of as mental health and psychiatric uh, settings, and a very clear understanding, uh, though this was by no means universal uh, in those uh, hospitals, that that was an important part of the experience of the, of the patients uh, living there. But I think it goes beyond that, that when we look in more recent uh, times, this a field of uh, arts and mental health has been very much shaped and part of a broader story of changes in mental health services. So that big deinstitutionalization so-called care in the community in the um, 1970s, 80s, uh, for instance, uh, very much influenced the um, increase in activity in the arts in, uh, in the community. Um, Organisations were formed. I'm thinking of, for instance, Art Angel in Dundee, directly by people who were service users in psychiatric hospitals, who then left those uh, hospitals to live in the community and brought with them work that was taking place on hospital wards and uh, created their own organizations uh, in the community. There's also, I think, an important um, interleaving between as it were, the political, the protest history uh, of um, uh, mental health and questioning of diagnoses, of discussions of um, people being survivors of uh, the mental health system, of um, the uh, radical questioning of psychiatry in the 1960s, both by patients and also by some psychiatrists themselves. That political history uh, is also very much a part of artistic history uh, with uh, artists adding their voice to that, uh, that debate. I think it's a fascinating area. Um, there was um, a really um, interesting exhibition, for instance, I think two years ago at um, the Bethlehem Museum of the Mind of that history of protest by patients and patients that were then going into the community. Um, and uh, the exhibition, if you want to look it up online, uh, was called Impatient. Um, I think there's a lot more to be said about uh, the history of developments of creativity and mental health. I'm delighted that um, the Mental Health Foundation in Scotland is actually producing a report very, very soon, looking at the experience in the, since the 1960s up until 2000 um, about, that, uh, about that history. 
and there'll be a rich digital archive of um, artists and founders of art organisations about their experience of mental health. The last thing I'd like to say thinking about history is that I have been struck, though it's probably unsurprising, that in, I would say, well over 100 conversations, perhaps almost 200 conversations, I've had with um, people working in arts organisations concerned with um, the creativity of people with experience of mental health problems, how often those organizations have been founded by people with uh, lived experience. That's been their motivation for the creation of the organization. Um, or, and at the very least, as it were, um, and this is also an important experience, uh, it's been an experience of uh, mental health problems in family uh, members that have driven people to a realization of the importance of uh, creativity. So I want to say a few words about um, the report that I think there's a link to uh, Creatively Minded that we uh, published uh, last um, February. Uh, as a very untidy person, uh, thankfully you can't see much of what's around me, um, I'm probably cursed with a rather tidy mind. And part of that report is trying to look at definitions and categories. And it's a fool's errand. Um, uh, everything is elusive and uh, things are very hard to categorize. But perhaps it comes with the territory of being a funder that we need to have some definitions and to... Um, uh, know what we're talking about. That report, Creatively Minded, has got a really, really important omission, which has been commented on um, frequently, um, which it does not talk about arts therapy. Um, I hope there's no inference that uh, that's any lack of uh, respect or value for arts therapy, but it is um, to say that it can be viewed differently from uh, participatory arts, which is uh, the center of our report. Um, our report also doesn't talk about so-called voluntary or amateur arts, which are also very important. Um, rather, we're saying that there is this actually very broad field of uh, artistic, um, creative, uh, professional, and I'll come back to that word, activity with people living with uh, mental health problems. And as an organization that was just starting to look at the field, we felt that was, was more than big enough uh, for our consideration and our funding. So almost everything in that report is about arts organizations um, that are, are working in the field. But what sort of arts organizations are we talking about? I think that there's a surprising number of arts organizations that see this as their sole focus. Certainly when we're beginning to think about um, uh, this issue, I wasn't aware of that and many people that I, talk, I talked about weren't either. And we gave last September, uh, and we're delighted that that included hospital rooms, um, 87 uh, grants to organisations that uh, focused either very, very strongly or in, in the majority of cases exclusively on working with um, people with lived experience of mental health problems. That was their raison d'etre. Almost the vast majority of those organisations are small. There's one or two with a budget over um, uh, a million, but um, it, it, it's not even the fingers of one hand. Um, about half of the organisations have a budget under 100,000 and uh, a quarter have budgets 
under 30,000. So I think you might agree with me that these specialist organizations are certainly small. And with that, often there is both a fragility and a resilience that comes uh, with that. Certainly the vast majority of them would see their work as very local and necessarily a small scale because their resources only allow them to deal with, uh, to work with, engage a relatively small number of people. So that's people that are very specialist, organizations that are very specialist. We then have, I think, a largely different tradition of, uh, that would describe itself as disability arts. That's got its own uh, history and trajectory, um, particularly uh, arriving at the same time in the 60s and 70s and discussion about uh, disability. By and large, those organisations are concerned with people with physical disabilities and people with learning disabilities. As I think everyone will know, a mental health problem is classified legally as a uh, disability under the Equalities uh, Act, but there hasn't been much overlap. Uh, there are exceptions between those disability organisations and work on mental health. There's then a much bigger field um, of uh, arts organisations that are specialising in areas where I think everyone would agree there is increased risk of mental health problems. However, that isn't the framing of the organisation. So an obvious example, so um, some of those areas would be um, arts organisations working with refugees and asylum seekers, with homeless people uh, in prisons, uh, care experienced uh, young people all of which for I think fairly obvious reasons uh, have an interrelationship with increased um, uh, risk of mental health problems. And I think there's a difficult debate or complex debate there about the degree to which those organisations are seeing themselves as um, specialising and thinking about mental health. Cardboard systems, for instance, a uh, very well-known organisation in, in the theatre field um, would very definitely say that that was a major concern. We then have an even broader field of participatory arts, difficult definition, but we would use that as community-based arts where people with um, either a great deal of experience who would say, I am an artist, that's my living, uh, that's, uh, that's what I that's what I do, or that I have a particular form of professional training, that those uh, participatory or community arts organisations are working with, uh, have specific projects with people with mental health problems. And again, a large number of those. What I think is interesting, lastly, when thinking about arts organisations in this area is, and I've never found that there's a grant going to anyone that's got a better name for me uh, than uh, this. I keep saying mainstream uh, organisations and I don't like it. Um, but what I mean is organisations that would see themselves as, um, uh, I mean, very big examples would be big cultural institutions like the South Bank uh, Centre. I'm trying to think of um, uh, Norfolk. You've got your writing uh, center, the museum. By and large, those have not specialized. There are, there are variations, but I particularly think it's marked that for the last 10 years, the Brain Foundation has been funding work on um, older people and uh, creativity. And in that field, there has been a tremendous swing where starting off with a small number of very specialist organizations working in care homes working with people with dementia now there are very few arts organizations of any scale um, certainly the large ones that would not say that they're interested in um, uh, people living with dementia uh, in their offer to older audiences on um, outreach to 
lonely, isolated, older people. That doesn't, by and large, seem to have happened uh, yet with mental health, perhaps for good reasons. In the last uh, uh, two, three minutes, um, that's the arts. We've then got this hugely complex um, uh, mental health system. Uh, uh, and on page 23 of our report, you will see what I think is a fairly uh, numbingly complex um, uh, attempt at a description uh, of that mental health uh, system, um, described by its author, who is a psychiatrist, as extremely oversimplified. So um, <laughs> I'm just saying that particularly when we're thinking about partnerships, which I know we're just about to go on to, there is often a, a, a difficult but very important uh, dialogue between those hugely different sorts of uh, organisations. Also, as a national funder, I need to think that there are four very distinct NHS systems uh, in the UK. And for instance, we're working uh, quite closely uh, with the Arts Council Wales, where there's a, a better integration in lots of different ways. The last thing thinking about the NHS would be wrong not to, to mention this is that we've got this enormous development of social prescribing, particularly uh, in England, which has got huge implications for everything that we're thinking about. So that's, um, there is much, much more uh, in the report. Hope that's given you a flavor. Uh, uh, we published that in February uh, last year. Um, a few of you may have noticed that a lot happened uh, after February uh, last uh, year. Um, I think that, of course, the uh, impact of the pandemic and um, uh, lockdown is profoundly important for people who are already living with um, mental health problems and to uh, the increase in that rate of mental health problems, the ONS, as I'm sure you all know, uh, claiming last year in June, a doubling of rates of dep uh, depression. Um, there's lots more on our website if you'd like to pursue this conversation. Since um, that publication, we've given a lot of grants. We've been funding a few festivals, a new one in Wales, about to fund a festival in Scotland. Um, we've got a new, I, uh, to us, very, very important grant round looking specifically at um, uh, ethnically diverse communities. Uh, we've got a, what I think, as I had, uh, didn't write a single word of it, I think a great report on that with a lot of uh, commentators and people with lived experience and case studies, which is called Creatively Minded and Ethnically Diverse. And you'll see a few more um, reports. So to conclude, um, when we first started um, to think about a new funding field uh, about creativity and people with lived experience and mental health problems, I, I was told, well, you're a small funder. It's probably a good area for you. A um, uh, little money will go a long way. Uh, there's not much happening uh, in the field. And I look back and the person that said it to me is uh, a knowledgeable, thoughtful person. Why on earth did they think that, given everything that I've just said? And I think in some ways it's not surprising because a lot of the activity is very small scale. It's beneath the radar. People haven't got the resources to... Um, uh, to uh, go into the media to talk about what they're doing. And I think it's um, not valued sufficiently. That's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. So I really want to thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this seminar, because I think it's an important part of that process of giving greater value uh, to this uh, incredibly important uh, work. I remember in what I call the before times, before um, February last year, I used to go and visit places outside my front door. So um, I hope in the future you'll be kind enough to uh, let me come and see you and come and see the work in Northside uh, House. Thank you very much.